The Texas Parks and Wildlife television series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're in South Texas. Five very distinct areas of the ranch that are very different habitats. Just seeing the joy and the excitement on the kids' face, it just it lightens your heart. The people that don't come from this, when they come and see these big, beautiful pines, this beautiful oak, and they just love it. They just fall in love with it. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Well, the San Pedro is very beautiful. It's unique, majestic. It's very atypical from a habitat standpoint. And there are so many different plant species and so many different animal species. I think a lot of people picture South Texas as prickly pear and mesquite, which in you know a lot of cases it may be, but I think that's what makes the San Pedro so beautiful in the fact that there's a lot of other ecological communities mixed in with your prickly pear. We're in South Texas, but uh, from the highest point on the ranch, you can see the Chihuahuan Desert. So we have this unique riparian habitat in a very dry area. Then we have some very deep open sand country. And then we have the, the gravel hills along the, near the Rio Grande. Really five very distinct areas of the ranch that are very different habitats. Oh, did you get it? Did he catch something? I think my grandfather saw a, a very good opportunity. Uh, he bought it, and of course, 1932 was uh, some of the worst years of the Depression. And he had grown up ranching. He, had, he, was, he was a real cowboy. Your first memories of working on the ranch or being awakened at dawn and you're saddling up your horse and you're helping to round up, and those were some of my earliest memories, and it didn't seem like a lot of fun at the time. <laughs> But looking back, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything. The San Pedro is a working ranch. Nine, nine, zero. The income that is generated is primarily through wildlife and cattle, which we run a registered Beefmaster uh, cattle herd here. Cattle can be a, a, a real asset to an operation, even if you're managing for wildlife. It's all in how you apply them and the San Pedro Ranch definitely uses them correctly. The brother and sister team works hard to benefit all wildlife and the people who make up the San Pedro Ranch. You know, Daniel Boone, who recently retired, uh, born and raised here, his father worked for my father for many years, and so we have a multi-generational uh, culture here. We each recognize what's important to the other about this ranch and respect that. For Pam, that's butterflies. For Joseph, it's quail. And the once caliche pit turned into a wetland hosts plenty of plants that benefit both species. This is Rio Grande uh, clammy weed, which is actually um, a pollinator plant, but also a really good quail plant. Quail and don't eat of... butterflies, do they? No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> just dawned on me. <laughs> but do quail eat butterflies? Absolutely. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I didn't want to tell her that they did. So now that she knows from Chase that they do, the solution is plenty of butterflies. Along with increasing butterfly habitat are a host of other projects, from building a wetland, planting native grasses over old pipelines, setting up artificial turkey roost, and the restoration of a creek. So it's really interesting work, and uh, they're, they're really doing a great job in restoring their riparian areas. And finally, the addition of a conservation easement to make sure the ranch stays the way it is for future generations. The land doesn't know your intentions. And it doesn't know the laws, and it doesn't know the regulation. The land only knows the results. And, and if your results are good and move you towards a, a stable, diverse native habitat, then that's good. But uh, all the intentions in the world won't make that happen. It, it requires active management. That's, in a nutshell, our philosophy. <laughs> Compared to a lot of people, I've had a pretty non-traditional outdoors background. I grew up in Metro Atlanta, I was born in New York, so I never really went fishing, but I was always outdoorsy with my friends in the neighborhood, and I really think it started from that. I recognized that being outdoors, I felt connected. My name is Michael Homer. Nice to meet you, Patrick. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your service, and thank you for being out here volunteering today. The fish are gonna be clustered with plants, and there's nowhere to go. All right, folks, if you are volunteering for the Texas Parks and Wildlife today, if you can kind of meet over here. We've partnered with Parks and Wildlife, Texas Parks and Wildlife, to uh, develop a neighborhood fishing program here on one of our smaller ponds, and that's been very successful. It's a huge collaboration with all kinds of outdoor recreational groups. We've invited anybody that's interested in coming and learning about fishing to come on out. Who wants to put the animal bait on? Trying to instill conservation beliefs, you know, preservation, protecting species. It all goes into teaching kids how to fish. It's part of the earth, it's life. It makes you feel alive. There you go. Oh, I gave you one already. There you go. Have y'all ever heard of crappie? Never heard of a crappie? Just seeing the joy and the excitement on the kid's face, it just, you know, it, it lightens your heart. Mike has been the reason that a lot of those kids have those first fish smile moments. And how do you know it's a catfish? His whiskers? Well, I'll tell you what, you're absolutely right. He really built a strong case as to why Abilene needed a community fishing lake because they didn't have one. I do what I do because I love it. I love it because I want to be a steward. And I've seen that from a lot of my peers within Parks and Wildlife. There are a lot of very talented people in this agency that do a lot for their community. It's humbling. I don't know if you've seen any caught it since you've been over here, but... Michael and his staff are, are willing to just do whatever needs to be done. They seem to love kids and, and love to uh, introduce kids to fishing. Let's go! Come on! I got it! He's built tons of connections within the community, and I think that that's the biggest thing, because without the support of the community, um, the program wouldn't be nearly as successful. We are in a vocational position where it's not a job to us, it's a service that's needed to society. Just speaking from the perspective of being a dad, reaching out to a kid whose mind is like a sponge, if you can get them hooked on nature, they're more likely to care about it as they get older. Being able to pass that feeling on has been wonderful. come from this when they come and see these big beautiful pines, this beautiful oak, and they just love it. They just fall in love with it. 
I was actually raised in this area and, and this is what I like. I don't like where I can see. You know, you, you can see forever in West Texas. Here, you, you can't see very far. About as far up in Northeast Texas as you can go is Atlanta State Park. The park is 1,500 acres of rolling hills and towering trees, hugging the southern shoreline of Lake Wright Patman. Inside the park, we have a mixture of native trees mixed with hardwood, a lot of red oak and pine, water oak, white oak, pin oak, a lot of different types of oak here, and it's all native. The Caddo Indians lived and farmed here long before Anglo settlers arrived. We are probably about 15 miles from where the Sulphur River feeds into the Red River. Their water supply was right here. They weren't nomadic Indians. They could stay here and you know farm here, and then they could just go right down river and trade and come right back up. Where the Sulphur River once meandered through, there is now a 20,000 acre reservoir. It's and it's full of fish. Catfish! Great white perch lake, a great catfish lake. It's not a real big bass lake. As far as catfish and white perch, probably, I would say it's one of the best in the state. I'll put it up against any other lake. There you go, girl. Good <laughs> job. This lake's got a lot of fish in it. Three catfish in the drum. We mainly come down here to help, you know, fill the freezers up and have fun doing it. Either about that little, we don't keep them. The changing seasons at Atlanta State Park draw visitors year round. In fall, the forest sparkles with shades of yellow and red. Dogwood blooms announce the arrival of spring. In summer, cool lake breezes, and shade from the towering trees, help make Atlanta State Park a relaxing place to pass the time. Picture yourself walking down through the trail. You've got you know, 80 to 90 foot pine trees and 80 to 90 foot hardwoods on both sides of it. It is beautiful. You can come here and you can be relaxed. You can come to get away and be quiet and peaceful. All right, Clevelands, let's make history all over again. Come on, here we go. The Cleveland family is recreating a photo taken 50 years ago. <laughs> Joan Angen got a surprise of her life one morning when she logged on to a local news site. There was this picture of my brothers and I, and I was like, oh my gosh, what is this doing here? The picture was part of Texas Parks and Wildlife's 50th anniversary celebration. First of all, I was just totally shocked to see the picture. <laughs> then the memories came flooding back. My father was a traveling salesman for Merck, and Mom would bring all five of us kids up here, and we would stay up here by ourselves with Mom, and we just literally just lived out here for a month at a time. The memories for, for us as, as kids and being boys, you know, it was just an awesome summer being able to do whatever you wanted to do. You could get up every morning and go fishing. You could uh, fish all day long and get tired of fishing, you'd go swimming. You know, it was a great summer. You didn't want to go back home for any reason because you had everything up here that you loved doing. And it was one of those happy summer days that a Texas Parks and Wildlife photographer snapped the picture. Here. I want y'all to try to recreate that photo at all costs. Fifty years later, another Parks and Wildlife photographer asked if they would do it all again. Recreating the footsteps of another photographer from Parks and Wildlife was a, a big thrill for me, something I, I really wanted to do. One more, here we go. One, two, and smile, smile, smile. If you look at the photo from 50 years ago, all of them look so happy and like they just get along and they connect well with one another. And if you flash forward 50 years, they look exactly the same way as they did in the pictures back then. The close-knit siblings still enjoy spending time together outdoors. You're in mom's station wagon and that buzzard. I think the third good relationship they have now is as a result of the years that they've spent visiting state parks. To help more families enjoy the outdoors, Texas State Parks offer outdoor family workshops. You're going to get two poles. Folks who have never camped before get to experience the great outdoors without spending a lot of money. We provide all the gear, the tent, the stove, cook sets, utensils. We provide air mattresses for the adults so you don't have to wake up with creaky bones. 
The only thing they have to bring is their food and their sleeping bag or blankets, and we provide everything else. For the Cleveland kids, Inks Lake State Park holds a special place in their hearts. Their parents' ashes are sprinkled there. After coming up here, it's like, hey, we need to get back to doing this again some yeah. more. You know, yeah. we're all lives were so busy now, but just coming up here today, is, uh, it's been great, you know, bringing back the memories. Yeah. Clancy Terry and his friend Richard Burge are chasing cats. No. Catfish, that is all around Lake Buchanan. Though their day began awfully early. What's your head? It also started slowly. Come on, fish. There has been a bite or two. Oh, there he is. And there has been some good-natured ribbing. He jerked it like a girl. No. <laughs> but so far, there haven't been many catfish. He's talking to you. It's nice little blue. See how pretty they are? It's the big one. But Clancy is known for catching. I guide for trophy catfish. In order to attract these fish, anchors away. Some 40 feet down, Clancy and Richard serve up a variety of smelly baits. My wife says I can tell when you've been catfishing. <laughs> right, there's one. The fresh shad seems more attractive to another fish today. Oh, it's a striper. Clancy guides for striped bass as well. Let's get Richard. That's about a three to four year striper. If you can get the stripers out of your way, you'd probably catch some catfish. <laughs> catfish are gonna be next. Get him, Richard. With some persistence, Clancy and Richard find what they've been fishing for. Catfish. Sure enough. <laughs> It ain't big fish, but something. And they'll be back to catch the big one another day. It's just a lot of fun. Especially if it's a big one. While some folks just enjoy catching catfish, others will literally line up to eat them. We got the catfish. I think it's worth the wait. Let's see. There you go. That fish is a great fish. Mmm, that's good. One weekend each fall, the Conroe Cajun Catfish Festival turns Conroe, just north of Houston, into a capital of Zydeco music and all things catfish. It's about everybody coming downtown and enjoying the catfish and all the food vendors and all the great Cajun music uh, and everybody having a good time. That's what I said. Right now, well, you know, catfish is a year-round thing. Yeah. The festival is also a chance for local fishing guys, like Carl Boston, to meet a few new customers and show off some Lake Conroe catfish. We get asked every year to come in and bring some fish, and the kids love it. You can't keep their hands out of the water where the fish are. <laughs> Soon after the festival, Carl is back on Lake Conroe. I think it's the best catfish lake in the state. Not with clients, but with friends. That's what I do on my days off. The two boats are out for an evening of jug fishing. Jugging, you're increasing your odds a whole lot because you can put up to five hooks on a jug, and depending on how many people you have out there, you could have hundreds of hooks working an area. Fish it. The GPS is really nice. Great little tool for us to track where we put them and find each jug. Even the jugs themselves have gone high tech. These are what we call flagging jugs. Whenever a fish pulls on the line, he'll slide the counterweight to the bottom, and then we know it has a fish on it or something's hit it. Toss it, Steven. By the time the boats have anchored all their hooks in the water. That's all of them. Some of the jugs have already flagged. There's one back to our left. Yeah, he's on here. There you go. A nice little blue cat. Catfish are caught, hooks are rebaited, Fishing. and jugs are returned. The circuit continues nonstop, and as night falls, the ice chest fills. <laughs> Thank you.
If you want to make a fish haul, jugging's the way of doing it. Jugging is also a good way to find the big cats. I think we have a decent fish coming up here. Pulling in a large catfish can require a little bit of teamwork. We got about a 20 pounder coming up. That's it. It's just fun to come out and see how many of the big ones you can catch. How much does he weigh, George? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we really enjoy it. We got him out. The thrill of catching a trophy fish does not require keeping it. 26-4. Take a picture of them, turn them loose, <laughs> let them grow. Maybe next year you'll weigh five more pounds. So Morris, Wayne, and George have their own policy regarding these big and most productive fish. They keep only a photo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and they keep a good story, too. Yeah, they want to see us when they get in that water. Well, that's a good start for the evening. Yeah. Let's see what we got. Increasing interest in catching catfish in large numbers or sizes has also increased the need for studying catfish. As the interests change, obviously the management has to change. Come on, little fishies, come on, little fishies. Nearby on Lake Livingston, he is, right here. biologists are learning how to measure populations of catfish okay. species more accurately. It does get fairly fast-paced. I've frequently heard it referred to as a, as a rodeo kind of collection. Up front, front right, Dave. If you pump electricity into the water, it ends up stunning right. fish. Uh, this has been known for a long time. Poachers did it in the past. We can do it legally, whereas others can't. It's a very efficient method. We needed thousands of fish to be collected, uh, tagged, and then released to get the answers we were looking for. Three ninety nine. Got it. The marking was specific to different fin clip combinations, so when we recaptured the fish, we could tell where that fish came from. A few fish were kept for some other samples for aging and those kinds of things. 798. Ultimately, standard sampling protocols will be developed from that. As biologists get a better picture of catfish populations in reservoirs and rivers, they can better keep catfish healthy and anglers happy. Whether you want to take some fish home to eat or whether you want to try and catch a trophy, uh, that's, that's kind of the goal in all of it, is to make sure those opportunities are there for everyone across the state. Here we go. Mine's big. I don't know mine's bigger. That means Carl and his friends <laughs> should always be able to go fishing for cats. We got a cat fight going on. <laughs> if I can be on this water, I'm going to be on this water. Whether it's a job or not, I'm going to be fishing. Oh, boy, you got another nice one. Whether on a hook, a little bit of a workout, on the menu, or on their own, there is just something fun about catfish. I've always been a catfish man. You know, they say we're a breed of our own, and everybody has their favorites on this lake that we make. We're happy about all this. 35? 35. That's a pretty Okay. I love it. <laughs>
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchases of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $50 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. And by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, helping to keep Texas wild with the support of proud members across the state. Find out more at tpwf.org. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.